Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Captain Mike MacArthur. I'm the director of the Sea Power Centre in Australia. I am also the officer responsible for um, parts of Pacific uh, 2015. We uh, work in conjunction with Maritime Australia Limited and we uh, collectively have put on that show outside there. So first of all, I hope uh, you've had a chance to um, walk around. Has everyone, first of all, has everyone had lunch? Did anyone not get fed? Did anyone get fed and they were unsat uh, that they were uh, not satisfied with what they were fed? Well, that's always a good that's always a good start. Listen, uh, it's important that we look after you, and, and CN made 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 it very clear to us early on that um, with you being out here, that uh, we were to look after you because you're important to us. Clearly, um, I've thought about how we're going to be doing this afternoon. Um, we've done a, a fair bit of preparation for this. And the last 10% the last 15% is the, um, the goods to market bit. And we're not too sure how exactly it's going to go. And it would depend very much on you people here. So um, I'm told that we have to break at 1500 because we have a really nice afternoon tea prepared for you. OK, but um, we, we're going to have to work it. So I, I'm just looking around. I'm doing a rough, rough count that we have about 120, 130 of you here uh, this afternoon. And when I looked at the numbers of the people that were here over the last couple of sessions, there's in fact more people were here, um, or, or the equivalent of more people here um, this afternoon than what we had, nearly what we had for um, Admiral James Goldricks and Professor Evans' um, presentation this morning, that, and the room looked pretty full. Um, it is unusual that we get this opportunity to have so many young thought leaders, so many young people so many of our junior officers in, in one space, which is why we spent a fair bit of time, the Sea Power Centre, in managing um, this particular session. Now, I would assume, <clears throat> I would assume that um, over the last six to eight weeks that you had seen our signals, inviting your comment regarding innovation towards an agile Navy, and that from your input, we have decided to speak to three particular themes. So. The point I wish to make is that we, um, the, the captains or the admiral, or the project director of NGN, Commander Nick Watson, who is down here, who will say a few words in a, in a moment. Um, these aren't our thoughts. These are your thoughts. And that particularly is the theme I wish for you to get embedded in, in the front of your minds right at the beginning of this discussion piece is that you have asked us to discuss the topics that we have chosen, the three topics that we have chosen, and I believe you should all have copies of them there in front of you. Has anyone here, put up your hand, is there anyone here who's not aware of the three topics that we have chosen or that you have chosen and that we have agreed to moderate this afternoon? They include admin burden, training and simulation, and the APB. Is everyone happy with that? Great. Um, a couple of other points that I wish um, to, to get out there um, before we start. Um, there is no left and right of arc here. There's no, we're not playing on a football field where there's any particular rules and regulations. You'd be amazed at what you can tell us when you throw a few sirs into the conversation. <laughs> so that's, a, that's, that's the point. We, we, we want your input and I have allocated about two and a half hours and I estimate that we should use that time because it, I assume that each one of you will have a point to make and if you take 60 seconds to make that single point, then if you multiply that by the number of people in the room, then we'll have to use up the entire period. It will only work if you provide us with your input. I know for some of you it takes a bit of courage to stand up in front of people to say a few words, so think about what you want to say now but I do expect, and I know there's some of you who can't wait to stand up and tell us exactly how it should be done. All right, so there, there's, there's some on that left-hand side and there's some on that, on, on that right-hand side, but I'm not only interested in ensuring that left and right, but also those in the middle. So um, it might be a challenge for some of you, the young midshipmen um, particularly, but I want to hear from you. All right, I wish to hear from you. Before we start, let me introduce the panellists. And the reason why I have selected some panellists is to help you think about the themes in which we are going to discuss today. On your very left, we have um, Mr. James Brown. James is a former army officer. He has seen active service in Afghanistan. He's moved from that role and is now a well-known 
academic. He has worked at the Lowy Institute and now James works at the US Studies Centre at Sydney University. Admiral Goldrick also invited me to tell you that James has written on a number of topics including Australia's ANZAC myth and its consequence. So we can also talk about that if things dry up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in inviting, in, in welcoming uh, Mr James Brown. On your very right, um, Dr. Alex Zielinski. And, and Alex, I really do appreciate your time. Um, Dr. Zielinski, or Alex, was appointed as the Chief Defence Scientist and Head of Defence Science and Technology Organisation, now the Defence Science and Technology Group, in March 2012. Um, before joining Defence, um, Alex was a Group Executive for Information Science, Sciences at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, CSIRO, and Director of its Information and Communication Technology Centre. Alex was Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Seeing Machines, a high technology company developing computer vision systems, which was a startup from the Australian National University where Alex was Professor of Systems Engineering. Dr. Zielinski researched in robotics and computer vision at the AIST Electrotechnical Laboratory in Japan and has taught and conducted research in computer science at the University of Wollongong. He started his career as a systems engineer with BHP Steel internationally. Um, Alex has extensively advised federal and state governments in Australia, including a member of the Australian Government's Defence Industry and Innovation Board. All the rest of it's there. Alex, we are really excited to have you here. And again, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in inviting to the, um, as a panellist this afternoon, Dr. Alex Zielinski. Thank you. <laughs> On Alex's um, inboard side, if I know what you, that means, we have um, Rear Admiral James Goldrick. Um, Admiral Goldrick. And I've known Admiral Goldrick for 30 years, and um, it's always Admiral Goldrick. Admiral Goldrick um, joined the Royal Australian Navy as a 15-year-old cadet midshipman in 1974 and retired in 2012 as a rear admiral. He is a graduate of the Royal Australian Naval College, the Harvard Business School of Advanced Management Program, the University of New South Wales, Bachelor of Arts, and the University of New England, Master of Letters, and a Doctor of Letters of New South Wales. He saw extensive sea service with the RAN, the Royal Navy and the United States Navy. He was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross for his contribution to naval strategy and planning in 2001. He commanded HMAS ship Cessnock in Sydney on two occasions, the RAN Task Group and the Multinational, multinational Maritime Inter Interception Force in the Persian Gulf in 2002 for which he was awarded um, a membership of the Order of Australia, the AM and the Australian Defence Force Academy uh, he commanded the Australian Defence Force Academy from 2003 to 2006. He understands it. He gets junior officers. As a Rear Admiral, he led Australia's Border Protection Command from 2006 to 2008 and then commanded the Australian Defence College, my mistake, from 2008 to 2011. August 2011 to March 2012 saw him acting command of ADVA again and in 2014, shortly after retirement from full service, he was made an Officer of the Order of Australia. He is a currently a visiting fellow of the Sea Power Centre of Australia and the Lowy Institute for International Policy, adjunct professor of the University of New South Wales, and the rest of it is on page 21 of your bio booklet. His books, he's um, widely published. Um, and again, um, his books of which, what number are we up to, please, Admiral Goldrick? Sure. Many. <laughs> and we have a new one that is just released, which I will um, show as we, as we um, bring to this, uh, as we bring this session to finalisation. Um, in fact, his new edition of the 1914-15 study of the naval war in Northern Europe was published by the United States Naval Institute in May 2015, with the title "Before Jutland." And Alex, on your left, just there, if you can hold a copy of that book up for me. This one. Available. Yep. Available for more good book shops. The gentleman on James's um, inboard, on, um, on his left, is um, Dr Milan Vigo. Dr Milan Vigo earned a BA in Naval Science from the former Yugoslav Academy in 1961 and a Master Marina's Licence in 1973. Dr Vigo Milana um, served for 12 years as an officer in the former Yugoslav Navy and for three years as a second deck officer in the former West German Merchant Marine before obtaining political asylum in the United States in 1976. He became a naturalised citizen in 1984. Dr Vago 
was an adjunct professor at George Washington University in 1983, the former Defence Intelligence College from 1985 to 1991, and at the War Gaming and Simulation Centre, National Defence University, Washington, D.C., before joining the Naval War Co College faculty in August of 1991. He was a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis, Alexandria, Virginia, and the former Soviet Army Studies Officer Office at the US Army Combined Center, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Kansas. Dr. Vega holds a BA in Modern History and an MA in US Latin American History, Belgrade University, and a PhD in Modern European History from George Washington University, which was awarded to him in 1981. Ladies and gentlemen, again, please join with me in welcoming Dr. Milan Vega. Now, what I wish to do now is um, I'm going to invite each one of the panellists to just to make an opening statement with regards to innovation and in relation to where, where, where they see fit in relation to the, um, the topics that we've provided um, to you this afternoon. I will then wish to invite to the stage before we start the discussion on the first topic, which I'm going to ask you to read out on my behalf, and your name is... Come up here for me, please. Thanks. Um, I'm then going to ask um, Acting Project Director of NGN, um, Commander Nick Watson, to give you an overview of what is going through CN's mind with regards to innovation, in particular with the recently announced and um, recently announced statement, Navy Innovation Statement, Challenge and Innovate. Um, James, could I start and invite you for a quick opening comment? Thank you. You might note he generally calls me Admiral, but he does still tell me what to do. So. <laughs> James, thanks. <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, James Brown, okay. please. Thanks, right. mate. Very good. Um, well, look, let me, uh, let me firstly say thank you for having me um, very kindly. Uh, Admiral Goldrick and I ran into each other uh, recently and he asked me to come along and I, I thought it was his way of reminding me that uh, I will forever be in the non-senior service. But uh, this is the right room to be in in Australia at the moment. I was talking to someone yesterday who was telling me that their, um, their son and daughter were joining the army and asked me what I thought of that. And I said, I've got two words for you, wrong service. This is the naval century. Uh, we, we are increasingly aware that uh, Australia is dependent on its maritime security, uh, on its maritime lifelines. Um, and uh, in case we weren't aware of just how potent naval power is, the Russian Navy, I think, is making the case for that right now um, better than anybody else. But you're in, the, you're in the right service, you're in the right room. And you're in a very exciting, uh, very exciting period, I think, for, for the Royal Australian Navy. Um, I'm so glad to see that today we're meant to be talking about the admin burden. As a junior officer in the Army, that was one of my biggest bugbears. I know that it's one of your um, biggest bugbears too. And looking at some of the submissions that were made to this forum, I can, I can hear you sort of screaming about this growing white noise of administrative taskings. Um, one of the questions I had for you, though, is uh, put, put your hand up if you're a lieutenant commander. Put your hand up if you could keep your hand up if you can tell me how much you're worth on an hourly rate. So how do we know we're wasting time if we don't know how valuable our time is? It's, we, we have sort of all these instructions in the, in the Navy and in the Defence Force for the value of an hour of sort of flight time, an hour of steaming time, uh, an, an hour of sort of public service administrative support. But I think one of the reasons we don't sort of recognise the administrative burden we're putting on our, uh, our junior officers particularly is because we don't have a way of valuing their time. In my current job, I spend a lot of time going to the US every time you pick up one of those immigration forms, at the bottom it's got a little note that tells you how long this form is meant to take to fill out and how much sort of administrative burden it puts on the system. And it's something I wish we did here because I absolutely agree with, uh, with the sentiment that we're sort of putting more and more administrative burden on the system. It's creating more and more white noise and friction without thinking about what's core business and what's not. And one of the questions I think in the pack for this was how do we work out what is core business? We'll just stop doing everything, and if you, you, you'll pretty quickly work out what's core business and what's not when it comes to administration. Um, we're talking about innovation today. Uh, part of that, uh, as, as was mentioned, is taking risks. Um, now is the time to take risks in your career. There's a guy in, in the Royal Australian Navy, I'm not sure if he's in this room, I won't, I won't mention him, um, but he's been very active in the, uh, in the sort of strategic and defence thinking space over the past few years. One of the best stories I've heard about this guy is that um, he went to uh, the Shangri-La conference in Singapore, 
sat down at a table and sort of thought he'd start talking about the recently released um, Defence Posture Review and turned to the person sitting next to him and said, God, I just read the Defence Posture Review. What a load of crap that was. I can't believe how poor the thinking behind it was and how average it was. And the person he was talking to said, really? Because I wrote it. <laughs> and this is a guy who is a young naval officer who's excited, asking questions, taking risks, screwing up, sure, but that's what you've got to do. And now's the time to do it. I've, I've, as, as Admiral Goldrick will tell you from the time he's seen me at the Lowe Institute, I've made more mistakes in the last four years than probably in the entire 30 before. Um, I don't talk about them publicly, but it's, it's, it's all about learning. And, uh, and if you don't take that risk, you won't, you won't learn. How do you innovate? Um, part of it is creating serendipity, um, being in the right place at the right time, increasing your exposure, meeting more people, um, going to more events like this, um, trying to get yourself to places you wouldn't normally go. Um, I'll give you four ideas on how you can sort of create an uh, innovation and an innovative culture in, in your spaces and then two old systems, I think, that are uh, as, as useful as ever in, in fostering innovation. Um, if you want to innovate in your different areas, um, go wide. Look at what's happening in other fields. Pick an incredibly random and irrelevant field. Look at what they're doing. Learn a little bit about it and think about how that could apply in your space. Who in this room knows how to code? Put your hand up if you know how to code. That's probably less than 5% of the room. Um, you know, there are 14-year-olds there are learning how to code. You can do it. It's very easy to do. Think about what that might do for your administrative burden or for your operational tasking or, or just for your own sort of professional development. Um, but look at fields you wouldn't normally look at because the best innovation, I think, happens in the margins of two fields where you take principles and experiences from one and just think about how you can apply them in another. Um, go weird. So look at really wacky areas. Um, you might think, what does a yoga ashram in India have to do with the Army's special forces? Uh, I could tell you that, um, that, that one of the Army's uh, top snipers, bizarrely, when he was going through a phase and, and, and dating somebody, ended up on, at a yoga school in Mysore, um, worked out that actually yoga is really good for your breathing and core stability, really helps your marksmanship, and as a result, Two Commando now includes yoga uh, in, its sort of, in, it, in its training for, for some of its people to improve their marksmanship. So that's a pretty weird solution to a very real-time problem. Um, go abroad, that's part of what you're doing here. Look at the experiences in other countries. We don't do that often enough and think about whether we do it better or worse. Uh, and go back because a lot of ideas have fallen away. A lot of them, um, as the historians on this panel will tell you, can be rediscovered. They might not have worked in the 70s, but they might be just right for today. Um, two systems that will help you innovate. Uh, the first, um, something that I think Navy does, again, better than other services, uh, networking. It takes practice, it takes time, it is a skill and you need to work on it. Um, small talk is, is horrible and awful and if you're not used to it, it's painful, um, but that's how you get innovation, by meeting more people and having more conversations. And the second is writing. Um, I actually think this is an area where the Australian Defence Force really needs a lot of work done. Um, you're not sort of, uh, you know, if, if you're wanting to get your ideas around, you need to write. You need to write to a publishable standard. And I think, you know, there, there are certainly excellent outlets for you um, to do that in, in journals like Headmark and other places, but uh, I think we don't sort of have a cultural sense that that's the right thing for junior officers to do. Uh, and finally, um, you can't innovate without being critical. That's tough to do in an organisation uh, like the Navy. Um, not only do you need to be looking at sort of what your superiors are doing and respecting it, but you also need to have the judgment to know um, not only could it be done better, but how you can communicate to people that it could be, could be done better. And we can talk a little bit about that as well. Thanks, James. Milan, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to be here for the first time in your country. I will uh, try to be short and I will uh, give you some thoughts on uh, importance of innovation and problems. You know, the innovation, even in war, when you, your aim is to destroy something, you have to be creative. It means creativity means the winning fast, you know, and with least losses for your own forces and also for the enemy forces. So creativity is a necessary, really, 
factor, not a component in any use of force in high intensity conventional war, but even when you deal with operation short of war, like combating piracy or combating terrorism, and et cetera, et cetera. But as you know, there are three types of, of, of creativity. One is organizational, in terms of setting up the task organization or organization operational level. The another one is a technological, that means uh, creating some new technological solutions. And person who is maybe technologically more gifted is not necessarily good for either organizational or what I call tactical or operational concepts. Uh, so the, there are three types, you know, and not necessarily one per, or one group of people is equally good in the. But you, are, you know, it is necessary to have a innovative approach to both organization, technology, and uh, operational or tactical concepts. There are problems, as you know, the in military is faced with many more obstacles to be creative than civilian artist, musician, or, or, or painter, okay? Uh, the reason we are that because there are some problems in inherent in, in uh, military organization, there's a hierarchy, which is necessary in order to have a, a smooth, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, force to operate properly. There is also parochialism, uh, you know, in the services. There is a group thinking where small group of people dominate discussion and impose their views on others. Uh, there is also what I call military correctness. We are all talking about political correctness, which is, in my view, is a horrible idea, you know, and we are all victims here, you know, United States, the whole Western world, you know, which is a really a reflection of totalitarian mindset, okay? The military correctness, for example, expressed, you know, in blind belief in the new technology, like a network setting warfare, ethics-based operations, you know, the systematic operational design. And unfortunately, I think sometimes the smaller military, like Australia, NATO, they follow U.S. lead, for example. It's one danger when the stronger nation has certain concepts and then they're uncritically, uh, uh, you know, accepted by the other nations. And I think it doesn't do good either to the United States or to the, their own country. You need a slow, you know, some kind of discussion and free, uh, open, criti you know, a critical uh, 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 way, okay? The problems is also, about all these things, is lack of critical thinking. You, without critical thinking, you possibly cannot be innovative, okay? And critical thinking is, you know, is, you know also based good part on reading. You need to read naval military history. There are many good uses of military history, naval history. And one of the, as I said, one of the best is makes you humble. We see that many people before us were also smart, but also made mistakes. I think there is sometimes great belief that we are somehow new, we have better technology, and we are somehow smarter, inherently smarter without any effort, you know. So I always tell my students, you know, you have to read. And there is no such thing as reading too much or knowing too much. So when I hear that somebody say, uh, it is too much to read, you know, I stop listening, you know, okay? There is no such thing, you know, that, that you read too much, okay? Uh, I think there is also here a problem with the leadership sometimes because the higher uh, officials, whether civilian or military, have tendency to be strong advocates for the certain technologies, for example, certain solutions, you know, and that also impact the views of the uh, junior officers and very often they are intimidated, or sometimes it's action taken against them if they have a different view. And I think when you have this kind of situation, you really don't have a innovation or critical thinking, okay? So I think the role of the high leadership is really to create an environment in which the free professional discussion should be not hindered. And uh, I think the probably one, I will give you the advice, you know, the, the, the flag officer, general officer should really avoid strong, being strong advocates of certain solutions or strong criti uh, critical, you know. They, they should leave this really to junior officers and middle level officers to dis debate these things, okay. Uh, and I think, you know, just as a conclusion, without the professional, free professional discussion, that means the organization lacks that self-correcting mechanism and is uh, bound to decline and bound to fail. And that happens also to society, it happens to civilization too. Okay, so we are not, uh, you know, just uh, the military. Every organization which doesn't encourage the critical thinking, you know, and discussion on professional matters is going to fail ultimately. Okay, so these are my remarks, okay. What I said.
If I could make some suggestions. First off, um, innovation can take several forms. Innovation, however, is not criticism on its own. In other words, being simply critical of something is not being innovative. You do have to try and come up with a constructive solution. The second is, we think of innovation as being, okay, here's a problem, I, you know, here's a solution from me, let's go with that. That's one form of innovation and you should do that as much as you can. You see a problem, you find a solution, you have a crack at implementing it. But there's another form of innovation which is really based on ideas and conversations and changing the way people look at something and think about something. And that innovation is achieved by network and by conversations and to some extent you will only see the results indirectly when you see that somebody who matters is actually saying something or doing something which aligns with how you thought things ought to change and had said things ought to change. And you may not be able to track that path. You may never be able to track that path. But I can tell you, quite often, that has been the path where a particular junior officer has actually observed something, made a suggestion, and it's actually clicked and then worked through. Which brings me to a point of the aphorism, there is no limit to what you can achieve as long as you don't think you're necessarily going to get the credit for it. <laughs> okay? You have to accept that stuff will happen and you know you did play a role in it, but nobody else does. Live with it. You'll get lots of credit for things you don't deserve. <laughs> My other one, and I do this with care, but I actually believe this is vitally important because the sort of operational stuff Milan is talking about is actually based on this premise. And frankly, successful navies operationally and tactically are dependent on this premise. Initiative, it is better to ask forgiveness than seek permission in many circumstances. Now, I say it with care because doing that needs judgment, okay? You don't do it when, how shall I put it, it's unnecessary. But you must be able to do it. And that includes innovation of all sorts of things. Sometimes, administrative issues, okay, you make a change and see what happens. Now, your administrative authority might smack you over the head, but something may result from that. Tactically, you may decide to go somewhere without telling the boss, and it turns out it worked, or it turns out it didn't work, and you live with the consequences. And that brings me to a point James made about writing and publishing, and I think I've had the conversation with um, more than one of you on this. I will say I have the proud distinction uh, of having achieved questions in Parliament while I was still a midshipman. I wasn't terribly popular. Um, but actually, reconstructing 40 years, you know, nearly 40 years later, I wasn't attacking any individual. I was simply disagreeing with a fundamental decision government was going to make. Some of you who are at for grads know enough about this to tell the others the full story. There's an irony, but um, the point is that I'd actually said things which had got into the public domain, which then became questions in Parliament, which were in opposition to a government policy. Now, I'm not recommending that <laughs> as something to do, um, but it might happen. What I am recommending, remembering very carefully what I said about when you do stick your head above the parapet, you're not making any personal attacks on anybody or things. But if you're putting up an idea or disagreeing with something or agreeing with something, it's again better to ask forgiveness than seek permission. And to some extent, as I got covered for, as I now know, by people who were then admirals, um, we can cover for it. 
but I do think not enough people are putting their ideas out, saying what they think about something and trying to engage in debate. And, you know, as long as you're not going directly for other people or you're not basically saying, and the government should go, <laughs> if you're talking about professional matters, it's generally okay. And frankly, I think as a culture and a military culture, and James has touched on it, we don't debate enough openly in the Australian Defence Force. Alex. Thank you. So thank you, Admiral. So I think I've got nothing left to say after those three uh, uh, great uh, speeches or uh, uh, points being made. But firstly, thank you, Mike, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to speak here. So innovation, it's one of those words that's used a lot. It's used a lot when we've heard almost three different definitions of it. And I, I think that I can't add a lot to it, but I think I'd like to say something. It, it is about ideas, but successfully implementing ideas. But the other part about it, you can implement it, but it, in the best possible way. And if you might think of like Google or uh, the companies like that, search engines were not new for the internet. They'd been a, a whole bunch of attempts have been made, but Google have done it better than any other one. And they now own that space because they have innovated, they've implemented their ideas in the best possible way. And I think what you need to think about if you want to you know, say I'm an innovator, okay, it's to come up with the idea, it's got to be the best idea, but it's got to be implemented, executed. And that's the challenge. Because anyone can say, I do innovation, I just take, implement something, or I told someone to do something that I had a great, a, an idea. And if you hadn't really thought it through, hadn't debated it, communicated with others, you may not actually, it may not be that such a, a great innovation in the end. And, uh, and sometimes we're not always sure whether this, this idea is going to be the best innovation, but, but actually get, getting to that point of uh, challenging each other, um, having those debates. And I think the thing I would say that one of the important things that I've learnt um, for, you know, if you want to lead and be part of innovation is the communication challenge. And you heard from the previous speakers about, you know, ability to write ability to read you know, and thinking about what you've read, but also the ability to engage in others in a, a debate. And it's a constructive debate where it's a, a, a challenge of ideas and you debate the ideas and, and out of that, the best ideas begin to win. And that's certainly what we try to do in the organisation I run because there's many clever people, many scientists, but it's all about having an objective uh, set of criteria trying to achieve and having that debate. So you've got to make sure that the best idea can come from anywhere and you've got to make sure you work in an organisation where the best ideas always win and don't have to come from the top. And so I think that communication skill of being able to you know, actively engage with others to read, write and debate is very important. Now going back to that, uh, the points about admin burden, uh, I've got to say it's sort of a thing that you we all <laughs> have it, and uh, in the sense of many organisations I've worked in, and the Navy, I think it's about 13,000 you know, war fighters. Uh, then you've got, uh, so I should say, sailors. I think is probably the right, the right job, uh, and war fighters. But uh, but then they're part of the ADF, which is 60,000 people, and then you take the reserves in, maybe 80,000, throw in 20,000 public service. We're in Department of Defence of uh, some 100,000 people. That's a big organisation, and you say, wow, a lot of administration and paperwork, etc. But uh, in my former life and before I joined Defence, I worked with other companies such as uh, Boeing, 165,000 people. Uh, Microsoft employs over 200,000. IBM, 450,000 people. Uh, General Electric, somewhere around 350,000. They are able to innovate, do things, run their organisations very successfully and dominate in the business sectors they do. And I've come to realise that uh, Australia does actually work against itself. We actually don't, our systems or the way we think don't necessarily scale up into large organisations. And uh, I remember going there to, to visiting Boeing once and complaining about admin burden uh, where I was working in uh, in a in the university sector at the time, uh, with it, and um, sorry, it wasn't it was a CSRO? It was, it was I was working at CSRO, and then I looked up on the board. Uh, they had these leadership values of what Boeing leaders have, and and they said, you know, one of the ones that stuck with me for it is Boeing leaders find a way, 
They find a way to get things done. You've got all these processes and, and procedures, but they actually find ways to get around, to work through these 160,000 people to get things, to get their business result, get things approved, etc. And I think, as the Admiral said, you know, you take this risk of uh, you know, asking for uh, forgiveness afterwards, but it's actually, an, and you, know, you do that in a very educated way. Now, I would call that finding a way to get something done. The other part where I would say where you need to think about going forward is that your field, uh, the, you know, the Navy and uh, your endeavours, is truly going to be technology dominated this century. It's all about embracing technology. And uh, if you look at what's happening in the com commercial area, I think I just read a report just last week that said f in 15 years from now, 40% of the jobs today that are, exist today will disappear. They'll be automated away through information technology, things like back office, accounting. These professions will not be around because uh, computer algorithms will do this. And you could probably think about, you know, the, even jobs in the ADF. And you look across the sort of jobs, how many that, that could be automated or changed. So that means we've got to be already willing to embrace technology. And, be, and I think, uh, you, you know, we heard James talking about, he talked about having the ability to do some software coding or thinking about that. That may not necessarily be everyone's forte, but you've got to be, I think, technology literate. That means you have to maybe read about technology, such as popular magazines, such as New Scientist, etc. Understand where technology is going, and be ready to be trained in new technologies or undertake uh, learnings about uh, or trainings in these areas. And that means you've got to also be open to grabbing new opportunities. And I've got to say, in your service uh, in the Royal Australian Navy, there is just going to be a mountain of opportunities with all these new platforms coming, be it the, uh, you know, you've got the LHDs, you've got you know, the um, your future frigates, you know, future submarines, uh, you know, the APV coming. This is just fantastic, fantastic opportunities. And these platforms will be loaded full of technology, uh, which will give you the opportunity to be challenged by them and be ready to, to be uh, to embrace them and to show innovation. Because ultimately, if you don't, I think you could be actually become a person who stands still, you'll become effectively redundant through technology taking over. To, and so as leaders, you've got to be continually looking at this. And I think this, the cycle of innovation will only increase, particularly driven by the business world. Just have a look at what the iPhone has done. It only came out in 2007, absolutely revolutionised mobile computing. And, and there's more of that stuff on its way. So I'll stop there and thank you very much. I'm just conscious of the time we're going to hear from C in a moment. I'm going to introduce you to our next moderator for this session, <laughs> Lieutenant Reuben Watson. I've just made that decision. So you better hope <laughs> I don't look around to pick you for the moderator for the next one. Eh? I hope... Uh, Hope you're prepared. So, Ruben, can you just um, briefly give us a uh, brief description of your career, and would you like to read out the um, the first challenge for us? Thanks. And maybe if you can just direct um, the Lieutenant Commander of where the microphone might go. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruben Watson. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, so, yeah, just as sir said, uh, he just wanted me to give you a bit of a background about where I've come from. Um, so I graduated from the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, 2005, uh, with a computer systems engineering degree. I uh, worked for two years uh, in the software industry uh, before, oh, actually about two and a half years, uh, doing various uh, sort of work in the software industry and uh, electronic um, industry before joining the Navy in 2009 as originally an MO uh, to get a different perspective on things. Um, and I pursued that career for about a year and a half, two years before uh, deciding to go back into engineering. Um, I decided to pursue a career as an aerospace engineer, specifically in the uh, avionics side of aerospace. Uh, so I commenced my training in 2011. I was at 723 Squadron as a trainee engineer before taking a position at the flight test unit, uh, known as a MAF2 Aircraft Maintenance and Flight Trial Unit. And um, I was there as an instrumentation engineer before taking on the position as a flight test engineer. Part of that role required me to go to the Empire Test Pilot School in the United Kingdom for a year and a half and conduct training there. And I returned from that position recently, so I'm uh, now in the flight test engineering position role and uh, looking to do uh, basically first-of-class flight trials next year, hopefully with ARH Tiger and uh, Chinook on LHD. That's my background in a nutshell. Okay, so uh, I'll just um, 
introduce the first topic, uh, admin burden. Uh, so according to a number of units and individuals, the administrative overhead imposed by outside authorities is preventing their greater focus on war fighting. As our admin and mandatory training workload increases, it necessarily inhibits the time available for the performance of core duties. This is especially apparent when members are routinely assigned to and undertaking additional work not associated with their billet responsibilities and professional training. Do we train people properly to deal efficiently with the requirements of admin and bureaucracy? What can we stop doing? What can we automate or complete more efficiently? Where can we innovate in improving the existing systems? And in particular, how can we harness the ICT tools available, either defence provided or commercial, to reduce or streamline the admin overhead for those at sea? So I open the floor to anyone who might have any uh, opinions on that uh, particular topic. Anyone who, wanna who wants to start off? Come on, let's go. Here we go. Stand up and let us know who you are. Now, the, the, other, the other issue that I haven't um, addressed here is that who, who he's actually going to talk to. Um, now, if you wish to um, respond on behalf of the panellists, please do, or if indeed the panellists wish, wish, wish to jump in to engage, you're also invited. Thanks. Right, so this is a bit of an open question and statement where we do see that innovation has come through uh, in systems like AMPS or our WHS uh, system that we currently have, uh, where I completed an incident report last night um, can, I, can I just uh, hold it? Can we avoid acronyms? Oh, yep, okay. Because <laughs> aged people like us are a bit out of date about. Yep, no worries. So, a good example is the uh, work health and safety reporting tool we currently have, uh, Sentinel, on the uh, Defence Restricted Network, uh, where you fill in a report there. Uh, it takes quite a bit of time, but you still have to fill out an OSA anyway, which is, takes quite, is a quite a lengthy process all by itself. So. What we've done is we've used technology to move forward in the WHS space, but we haven't actually removed the burden in this instance from, say, writing the OSA. So whilst that system is good, we've actually just doubled the, the amount of work that is uh, you know, required to be done to actually complete these tasks. So yeah, that's an open question there. Thank you. Okay, no. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. So just to, just to quick on the information is Perth, but um, so I guess just to gauge what you're trying to say, I guess you're, you're saying that evidence of innovation is occurring already, but perhaps as an organisation we're not good at closing old things. Is, is that what you're trying to, trying to get at? Yeah, it's not that we're closing things, we're actually getting rid of the old things. Basically, we made a lot of people up uh, through the technology that was already in place. Uh, Yep, just sorry, Senator, just, just to you. You go, Alistair, old 816 Squadron. Um, it's not so much an issue with bringing the system in. What we're, we just didn't develop a very good system. So essentially, we're still using OSIS because Central doesn't work. That's the problem. Um, we developed a system, we didn't implement it properly, we didn't do the appropriate training, we didn't get enough um, feedback from the people on how we actually wanted to, to use it and make it user friendly so it actually works. So Navy is still using OSIS because the system that we got doesn't work, doesn't suit our needs. Um, regarding the point that was brought up earlier about how much it actually costs for us to um, do our job, um, I looked at it a couple of years ago because I got annoyed with how much mandatory training we were doing. Um, worked out how many people we got at the squadron, how much each person gets paid based on fee man, so you proved how much money we get, and it ended up being around $270,000 per year, and I think it was about 10 days worth of manpower each year to do mandatory training. Um, Following from the Obviously, the question before, but do we require to do this? What do all this training? Why do we need to do so much mental training each year? Who says that you only remember how to do, um, yeah, E&D for a year? Why can't it be two years? Why can't it be five years? Why can't it be a whole career? Um, I'll pose that question as well. Excellent. Uh, just at the front. Hello. Uh, Lieutenant Darren McDevitt from the MCD Group. Uh, I wanted to uh, offer a bit of an answer to that first question that came up. This is an idea I uh, came with coming in here, was the, uh, the one in, one out rule. Uh, I say that we've, uh, we can say that we've reached critical mass with the amount of mandatory training and paperwork we do. 
And that's fair enough. We need to, we're an innovative organisation. We need to think of new ways to report new things to do. So we can't say no more, but what I think we can say to achieve the outcome is the one in, one out. If we come up with a new reporting system, it means an old one needs to go. If there's a new way to report fuel use, it means the old system is no good, it needs to go. Uh, if there's a new way for safety or personnel reporting, it means something else needs to go. This can be a tangible outcome that we can take up to the Chief of Navy to say, because innovation is really hard to say that we've actually achieved something, it's, it's hard to get tangible results. But if we say we have a, a one in, one out rule after this, uh, we've reached our critical mass, then we can say we are being an innovative Navy moving forward. The one in, one out. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant, I think it's also from a math too. I've taken a picture of Rube so I can take it back to the unit and he has to buy us all a cake. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to point out uh, something that uh, we talked about uh, at work before we came. Um, something that's been done right. Uh, who's used the online accommodation booking tool recently in DHA? Who has found that far better than any of the previous systems where you call up the base, there's a guide on the base that you're going to, if you're doing a group booking, you call a phone number and they help you out, they get you the best room they can find. That's an example of where something's been done really, really well. Um, the second point, talking about annual awareness training and those sort of things, I think that's a really good point. Um, I finished my degree in 2009 and I have it every year had to go and conduct a refresher on my core engineering skills. I'm not required to go and read over any academic textbooks. I'm not required to, um, to touch that core skill. But every year, I have to spend probably about 30 minutes, because I pretty much memorised the PowerPoint presentation, for drugs and alcohol, or for E&D, or for WHS. And just maybe posing a, a, a point to the far more intelligent members of the, uh, the panel than myself. Um, how long do we have to spend between um, judging that people understand a topic? How often do we have to refresh that topic? And the guidance associated with um, annual awareness, where, where does that sort of genesis, you think, you think, come from, that we have to refresh the non-core skills every year, but our core skills we don't necessarily have to revisit? Yep, effort. Hi, uh, Lieutenant Tom, Tom Mappy, Search Man Success. Uh, just follow on from what Lieutenant Orr was saying before. We just completed a seven month performance with Fleet Broadband. So combined up, down, two, uh, 256K, that's the same as a home broadband connection. A lot of these solutions that are being brought in, they're innovative and they work if you're sitting in Nara or a Cuttable. Um, they don't work in the fleet, they don't work on patrol boats, they don't work on Success or Sirius. Um, has anyone tried to use Sentinel from the ship? with fleet broadband, or has anyone tried to use an AE505, the new travel requisition form, <laughs> from a ship? A lot of these amazing solutions are coming in from the outside. They don't think at the lowest capability level, and unfortunately, over half the Navy work at that lowest capability level, and the solutions just aren't working. At the moment, it's taken about 45 minutes to submit a travel form, which used to take five minutes with an SBR, but that made work for IDS of Townsville, and they passed that work back into the Navy, and it's <laughs> taking too much time. I don't want to diss Sentinel, but I just wanted to clarify what Lieutenant Wall was saying. It was a lot harder at sea with uh, Fleet Warband. That's a good point. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, actually, in the definitive of young, I just want to point it out. Um, <laughs> Lieutenant Wayne Langworthy from uh, HQ, uh, Albatross. Um, I want to make two points. One that I agree with gentleman over there with respect to our duplicit way we do reporting in safety instances, we have the same problem with ASORS, and then if we would have a fuel spill, fuel spill with ASOR being an uh, aviation safety occurrence report, um, we would have to also then uh, present with a OSA. So we're then duplicitly doing the same work, and my previous CO cut a lot of that stuff away and said, one reporting system for aviation, and that's the way we did it. Um, the other point I wanted to raise was when we talk about the systems we got and the innovation within our squadrons or within our ship with updating publications is we seem to have a hold up with, and I don't know what it is, with embracing the wireless technology, um, especially within our squadrons and our publications, we could have stuff contemporarily uploaded straight away as opposed to having to wait for it to come out. Um, so I would just I'd like to see something like that um, put on the top of the think tank that we can... Um, uh, get around all the security measures for, for that. 
Do you have an opinion on that, sir? Before we pay? Well, I, I just want to, because it's interesting, the, the problem's been mentioned, and perhaps we need to crystallise that we actually have a dilemma. You're talking about a fibre optic based information process. He's talking about the realities of being in mobile platforms which rely on satellite or, you know, radio data. No, I understand that. They're yeah. two completely different things. So what yeah. I'm talking about is like within a ship having a wireless system where possibly they could use no, that. But, but, but there's the problem. I mean, I think we've really got a difficulty about the problem of getting the stuff into the ship. I'm more just talking about general for our publications within the squadron and the security. Yeah. Every time it's, it's said there's a security issue with having a wireless system mm. within our squadrons. So, mm. I don't know, the other birdies agree that it would be a better system for us to have wireless within the squadrons to use and to download for publications. Because we're all going to e-publications now. No, I'm absolutely. And, and I'm not disagreeing about the wireless within the squadrons. What I'm saying is I think there's this parallel problem in that we have to have a system that's going to work for the mobile units, which have much, much more narrow bandwidth. Um, and perhaps that's one of the dilemmas the Navy hasn't been addressing, that there needs to be this sort of dual, dual reality. <laughs> there's one virtual reality and there's another one. <clears throat> yeah, definitely two aspects, sir. Uh, yes. uh, Matt, I've got, I've, got, I've got four points to make <laughs> on uh, admin burden. Uh, admin burden. <laughs> Uh, the first is to use your senior sailors. Uh, as junior officers, we don't have to do everything. You have divisional senior sailors who uh, need the work experience and they can help you with your admin burden. Uh, two is um, there are new systems coming in like the uh, Navy Management Diary that incorporates other systems like the uh, Asset Management Planning System, AMPS, uh, Monica, and uh, the Personnel System, PMPs. It incorporates a lot of data and uh, streamlines processes However, there are concerns with privacy because it gives everyone access to a whole bunch of information they previously may not have to have had, and also security. Uh, previously, a CEO's report on Monica would be classified at a very high level and not openly available, and now all of this information is being pulled together on a uh, low-level classified information and therefore uh, potentially could be a security breach. Uh, the third for um, things like mandatory annual awareness training in, in uh, individual readiness, we could tie that to service allowance and make individuals accountable. If they don't remain IR compliant, they lose $15,000 a year and uh, that could uh, encourage them and stop us having to uh, continue to monitor and push them to do their MAT and IR. Uh, fourthly, when I was in charge of a patrol boat, I lost my um, G drive and also all satellite access and it was the most peaceful time I ever had. So um, we don't really need all of these different systems to still do our job. Thank you. Uh, yep, just front here. Oh, sorry. Just front here. Uh, this is just a, a point of view. I come from uh, MHC, so it's a sort of a smaller Navy. Uh, we don't have as many channels, as many bits and pieces as uh, some of the big ship officers and sailors do. Uh, one of the big problems that we do have is our, our ICT services on board, sir. Um, a lot of the new changes, the new programs coming through, the new processing applications that uh, the Navy seems to be adopting, whether it be uh, Nature of the Beast being a mine and war vessel, uh, we don't have the processing power, nor do we have the, the updated ICT hardware, laptops, software, all that sort of stuff uh, to support this. So we're finding kind of tying in with bandwidth and not being able to download forms at proper speeds and processes which have been changed to shore but aren't really translating positively to the mine and war vessel. There's a lot of business and a lot of things that we can't really do anymore and it's requiring us to reach out, whether it be through that phone communication, email, which may take a few extra days, and a lot of it is now requiring uh, external agencies uh, to provide us with information, which prior to the change, we could, we could still do a lot um, internal and, and organic to the ship. So just from a, a minor war vessel kind of point of view, uh, we are quite limited, and with a lot of these good changes, and I do 100% acknowledge them, but just from our, our side of the fence, it is starting to make uh, life a little bit more difficult. Back there, please. Uh, Lieutenant Mark Esposito, 725 Squadron. Uh, my question is, how do other navies get around it? How does the US get around having small units, uh, other ships sailing around and get past the uh, ICT problems and the uh, bandwidth issue? A US Navy 5 Alt class patrol boat has two master's receivers on board. <laughs> That's the smallest they get. <laughs> 
Sorry, that's good. <laughs> Uh, so, Lieutenant Ross Cook from HMAS Perth. Just a discussion on the Navy Management Diary. So, there's some great things to be bought from it, but um, anecdotal evidence of Monica being, and Mercury, and AMPS, and PMPs all being run concurrently with that system, and no umbrella system to actually bring it all to the Navy at the same time, whereas a long waiting list of ships and certain things being done at different times. So, I want to bring the final question, or my, my final point. The federal government have just bought into, um, into power a Minister for Innovation, do we as a Navy need a, a group which is going to involve all the innovative ideas that we're bringing at this table together to actually have what is becoming a Navy of good ideas to one direction in the right way? Yep. <coughs> G'day all, my name's uh, Kai Hayden, I'm Flight Commander HMS Darwin. The um, questions I have is, we all asked to uh, be in this organisation and we weren't told to be here. So how do we get to the point where we have a fear of accountability? Like we all joined up in our chosen core or job to deliver capability. So how, how did we get here? So if Navy was a business, how long do you think it would take before the business would be bust? So my question to the board, sir, is previous generations of the Australian Defence Force, not just the Navy, how did they cope and how did it we get here with this fear of accountability? Is it the WHS system? Is it you know, other lessons learned? And for outside, business and industry, how, is it, how are they dealt with the changes that we have to deal with as an organisation? And what lessons can we learn to employ in our service to provide better capability and remove this fear of accountability, which I think is a better term for ad administrative burden? Okay, yeah, sure, sir. Hold I'm going to throw it to James to start off with because I fear think of he's... Yeah, the fear of accountability because you've really grown up, I think, with, with actually over the change. So I'd be interested in your... Yeah, um, look, I, one of the things that I, I've found leaving defence and, and getting outside defence is that I think um, in defence there's more of a tendency to the perfect... Um, so, you know, we, we hear these problems, we think, right, we're, we're, there's some orderly system where we can just line, it, line everything up and you sort of see, you've probably seen your colleagues coming up with these org charts and diagrams and process maps, you know, we'll get it right. And so I think, um, ironically, when it comes to our administration within defence, we're probably not as tolerant of kind of complexity and chaos as, as people in the outside world are a little bit. So. You know, I can guarantee there's some guy at BHP or Rio Tinto sitting in a mine in the Pilbara um, damming his internet connection because he can't upload his OSA or his OSA or whatever it is or whatever system he's working on. But the, the accountability question is a really good question. Um, and you can see cultural differences between navies around the world. So the US Navy has fired an unbelievable amount of COs in the last three years. I don't know what the number is. I stopped counting when it got to sort of 21 in a year um, for running ships aground, for uh, loss of confidence in their ability to hold operational command, for drunken escapades, for inappropriate relationships. Um, but there is a clear culture in the US Navy, particularly in Pacific Command, of cutting COs to show accountability to send a message. Some people would argue they've gone too far in that direction. Now here, um, we, have a, we have a different culture. Um, you, you would see a clear difference in the culture that we have here in terms of um, firing and, and senior officers or, or, or people in command. Um, I think one of the issues we have in culture here is a highly legalistic culture. Um, so what, you know, why do we have two oh and systems? Um, it may not actually be within defence's control. It may be something that Comcare has initiated. But when I look at the Australian Defence Force, I see one of the things um, that I think is different to other defence forces is multiple layers of legal review um, and a very, very legalistic approach to administration, bureaucracy and, and increasingly command. And I think that really hampers accountability. If I may... It's something to say about U.S. Navy. I'm not a U.S. Naval officer, but I, I'm a long time associated with the Navy, and I think I know the problem. I agree with uh, Mr. James on the problem. I think there's some fundamentally 
wrong things because we have an inordinately high number of the COs, exos, relieved from command. And I think in many cases probably that's all uh, uh, justifiable, necessary. But I think there are in too many cases, uh, like grounding, for example, in some other things, uh, it's just, I think, rush to judgment, you know. And in process, I think a lot of maybe true war warriors, war fighters actually dismissed. And I will give you some examples. Uh, the Navy was different in interval years. For example, if you read the uh, life of Admiral Nimitz, he grounded a submarine in the Philippines. He smashed the superstructure one oiler when he was a CEO of the heavy cruiser Augusta. He was Navy captain. He was still promoted. Uh, Admiral King, one of the, our greatest uh, admirals, was uh, having a three fitness reports negative for his attitude toward the superior, the drinking and things like that. And Admiral Spruance was uh, admonished by the Secretary of the Navy, the co commander. All of them reached f four ranks of fifth admiral. In today's Navy, that will not, th this kind of people will not exist. So there's something fundamentally wrong with the way people are promoted, you know, and also dismissed from the uh, service. Uh, we have s frequently, you know, and as you know, if you read our press, you know, and, and the, especially US Army is now pushing this, what they call mission command, okay, which is a German style or decentralized command. Uh, and I, very often I have a discussion with, uh, about that issue, and when they ask me whether this possible, I said no. In the in a US military, when you have a zero error tolerance, you don't tolerate any error on the part of subordinates. You have no mission command. Then a mission command is only a buzzword, is, is empty of meaning. In a true mission command, uh, the, what you know start, the, actually was a, uh, started under the uh, General von Scharhorst at the turn of the 19th century, then uh, uh, General Moltke in German army. Uh, it was considered, you know, that the uh, high commander cannot possibly know better. Uh, you know, situation on the scene than the subordinate. So it was the way to command was to issue commander's intent. And commander's intent was, provi was aimed to provide a framework within which the subordinate commander would exercise initiative. Now, that was not, uh, uh, you know, absolute. If the subordinate commander in the process, you know, endangered mission as a whole or mission of the adjacent commanders, then, then there is no mission command. But in all other, in very fast moving situation, it was considered that it's better to allow even errors on the part of subordinates, but collectively, these people will always act with initiative. If you don't have a, a you know, the Navy or Army, where officers, officers are not educated, you possibly cannot have mission command. Then you need a directive command. That, that means it requires some things you know, to put in place in order to be effective. One is education, another one is also leadership, that if the uh, subordinate commander doesn't trust the higher commander and vice versa, you cannot have a mission command, okay? So the, these are missions that require a lot of these requirements in order to uh, be effective, you know? And I think, in, unfortunately, today there's too much but, uh, Admiral Godwick was referring to too much use of acronyms and buzzwords and not really uh, looking at the meaning, actually, okay? I don't know your situation, but then I'm telling you that, that uh, in any organization, whether it's military or non-military, where you don't tolerate errors on the part, you know, made in good faith by your subordinates, you have no mission command. And you possibly cannot have a, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the initiative. You know, today is very often the commander at the operational level frequently interferes, bypasses, you know, the subordinate commanders. That kills the initiative, kills the trust. And when you have a, in a peacetime, a long period of time where this is things is going on, you cannot change this when the war comes. The, this kind of officer corps is not, will not be ready to perform well in wartime. If I can take that up uh, from an Australian naval perspective, and I'm current enough and well informed enough and um, recent enough to tell you that it is a subject of considerable and continuing agonising, getting that balance right. Because as Milan has made the point, if you get into zero defects culture, you are not going to be able to fight a war because nobody is going to take a risk, take the initiative. But you also, there are mistakes 
which do undermine the confidence you have in a person that in another circumstance they'll do the right thing. Uh, we have a recent example in the Australian Navy where the Chief of Navy did actually relieve a commanding officer because of a number of errors made in relation to maritime boundaries. And the Chief made that decision because his confidence had been undermined because of the nature of the error. And it is also true that WHS, risk, manage, risk management and so on, do militate against allowing error. All I can say is we have to keep working at that and encouraging it. Um, you know, there's a, the front six inches of my first command is embedded in a wharf in Cairns. <laughs> and after I did that, having said that was my fault, and it was, my boss said, well, you're not going to do that again, are you? And the point, as I, as I used to say, talking to commanding officers designate, was don't make the same mistake twice, then we'll think you're stupid. But it is a genuine subject of continuing concern, because I'll throw it back to you, and James can comment. How many times have either you or you've seen at your level somebody effectively refuse to accept responsibility for taking a decision on the spot because you knew you could throw it back to your boss to cover for you? Because I know that was happening in the army in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I know as border commander quite a few years ago I was seeing a bit of that from some CEOs. Um, so, you know, culture works in both directions. So it's something we all have to keep working on. But I can assure you it is something the admirals really worry about. I will just add, if I may, just a short comment. The, the mission command is, is not an absolute. If you have a situation where you have a crisis, for example, which can escalate to war or hostilities, certainly you should not have a mission command. Okay, you should not risk, you know, that some of the subordinate made such a mistake that, that lead to much greater consequences. My remarks were that when you have a fast-moving, highly dynamic situation in conventional war, then that mission command is appropriate. But provided that you have excellent leadership, that they have a, a common tactical operational outlook, and they have also a, a great deal of trust in higher leaders and vice versa. Otherwise, you have to then uh, rely on directive command or directive orders. So mission command is not a panacea for everything. And I think what we try when we teach, there are two methods, centralized and decentralized. And we have to apply this based on the mission and the situation. Okay, it's not always to apply, but mostly applicable for the you know, situation which is fast moving and the, you know, the higher commander or higher headquarters cannot possibly know better than the commander on the scene. Okay. So. Thank you. <clears throat>